Awaken Beauties, finally, it's here. The truth to empower women to true inner beauty through a healthy mind and inner biology. I am your hostess, Cassandra Keel, a 20 year salon owner, organic beauty product formulator, positive mind management, and clinical hypnotherapist. And I am here to help you stay sane, get sleep, and bring your sexy back. Sponsored by evokebeauty.com, evoqbeauty.com. Now, let's get to it. Welcome to the Awaken Beauty Podcast. I am Cassandra, your organic beauty, positive mind management, and endocannabinoid mentor. And today we are gifted to have lovely Anna Garrett on the Awaken Beauty Podcast. Now, most of the listeners know my passion about hormones, but I believe Anna is a bit more passionate about hormones than even <laughs> I. Um, but uh, today we're going to talk to Anna about all facets of perimenopause and menopause and all the trickle-down effects of how it affects women in our mental and physiological health. So before we jump in, I'm going to talk a little bit about who Miss Anna Garrett is. So Dr. Anna Garrett has been a clinical pharmacist for over 20 years and has worked in a variety of practice settings. While traveling her career path, she discovered that women with working with women in midlife is her true passion. She offers a variety of services, including hormone balancing, weight loss, and health coaching designed to help women in perimenopause and menopause escape from hormone hell and feel amazing. Dr. Anna is passionate not only about helping women get their hormones balanced, but also about teaching women how to advocate for themselves in the healthcare system, which is so needed. Dr. Anna received her Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Pharmacy, is also a certified intrinsic coach, and studied through the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And lastly, very exciting for Dr. Anna, she is the author of Perimenopause, The Savvy Sister's Guide to Hormone Harmony, which was published just this last year. So yay. So Anna, are you with us? Yes. Yay. Well, like I said, you know, like you, I, I may not be as passionate about hormones, but I am extremely motivated to really help women understand and connect the dots between, you know, our hormone health, our mental health, our physical health, you know, and this trickles down, like I said, in, you know, it can look like weight gain. We can feel like we're going crazy. We often don't feel hurt at the doctor. So there's a plethora of women coming out and really stepping up their game and helping women connect these dots. And I think when we have our own personal ha-has to what we're experiencing and we have women like you helping us connect those dots, it's extremely helpful. So thank you for your life cause. And I think maybe to start us off, we can maybe get to know you just a little bit more on kind of where your path in life has brought you to this great exploration of helping women explore their, their hormones. Well, it has not been a straightforward path by any means. Never is. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, when I went to school the first time I got an accounting degree, God knows why, but I have one. Um, but I just didn't like it at all. And so I got into healthcare in my late twenties and, and went to pharmacy school twice. Um, and a series of jobs in just about any practice setting you can work in, in pharmacy, except retail pharmacy. Hmm. And so the last full-time job I had was at the hospital here in Asheville, North Carolina. And I was a manager over several areas. And one of the services that we started to provide was health coaching for the employees. And I had taken my coach training certification. And so I started to provide the service. And so I would invariably get all the women who were, they'd come in and they'd say, I'm 49 and blah, 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 blah is going on. And I was like, this is really interesting. Um, but one person in particular really stands out for me as, as somebody who sort of solidified 
the wait a minute, I gotta, I gotta do something about this because I know how. And she um, had actually ended up in the psychiatric facility here twice. Once on the good side, as she puts it, and once on the bad side. And mm-hmm. the good side is when you check yourself in, and the bad side is when you try to commit suicide. And she got on all these psychiatric meds, and um, she was like, you know, I just knew that I wasn't going crazy. I knew it was something else. And so ultimately, this was before I even started my business, she ultimately wound up with a doctor who specialized in hormones and checked all the hormones and found that she was completely depleted of everything. And so she got started on some bioidentical hormone replacement. And it was like the light bulb went off. She got off all of her psychiatric meds and just was like a new person. Wow. And I was like, really? I don't know anything about this. Let me go find out. Um, So I spent the next, I don't know, two or three years kind of poking around the edges of it. And I had a friend who um, lived in Durham, North Carolina, who owned a compounding pharmacy. And I said, can I come spend the day with you? It sounds like you're doing some really neat things. And so she was doing hormone consultations and I went, spent the day. And when I walked out the door, I knew that that was what was going to happen. So, um, yeah. (laughs) So you, you definitely saw the impact, you know, that simple changes, uh, complete understanding and understanding your baseline and where you can start laying those bricklayers of putting the puzzle pieces back together. And, you know, the short changes is often women end up at their doctor, you know, we're, we're in this medical system, just, it, it is what it is, negative or positive, it's needed. And we, we have maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes to converse with our doctor. And these are really, really impactful times in women's life, whether it's depression or um, PTSD or all of these things, mind, body, and spirit is all connected. And so when we're, when we're going to the doctor and we're trying to figure out our hormones, one, I think, lack thereof of education on you know some of the doctor's part because of the constraints that they have. And women ended up on Google finding all these different things going in with ex- exceptional amount of fear and all these different fragmented pieces that they think they have. It's really hard for these two things to kind of come together and women to feel heard and the system to be able to deliver their needs. And so my assumption is, you know, through all these different paths that you've been down, you know, and now with your book, you you really have been able to kind of create that triangle top down and help women understand what it is, what affects them. And so maybe we can, you know, start at, you know, your new book is about my perimenopause. Right. Um, and so let's maybe just dive into what is perimenopause? When do women start to experience it? Kind of what are some of those top line um, symptoms, so to speak, so that women can first be aware of what it is and how they should prep for it? So perimenopause is a time period that lasts anywhere from five to 10 years on average for most women. And it begins when you aren't ovulating as frequently as you once did. So you may not ovulate every month. You may still have a period, but you may not ovulate. And so when that happens and you don't ovulate, then your progesterone levels begin to fall and they fall pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. That's, that sort of kicks off the whole cascade of things. And so the, the most common signs of it look like a lot of other things. So you may have new anxiety or you may have insomnia or you may begin to gain weight or have mood swings or breast tenderness or fatigue. And so most of the, or crazy periods, that's another one. Um, Those things are fairly nonspecific, at least Mm -hmm. anxiety and insomnia and fatigue, they're kind of nonspecific. And so what happens is a woman in her early 40s shows up at the doctor's office and says, I'm having anxiety, anxiety, and I can't sleep. And nobody's thinking perimenopause, um, because the doctor's going to say, you're too young. Mm -hmm. And they walk out with an antidepressant or something like Xanax or another benzodiazepine, maybe birth control pills. Right. And, and none of that solves the root problem because nobody's looked for the root problem. And so what I want women to understand is that, you know, I wrote this book 
for a group of women who don't even know that they need it. So I really wrote it for women who are in their mid to late thirties mm -hmm. so that it could be sort of like the, what to expect when you're expecting from the perimenopause side. And so that they could get educated and go, you know, that's really interesting. I've never had insomnia before or hmm, anxiety. That's not like me and begin to try to put the pieces of the puzzle together themselves so that they can go to their doctor or they can contact somebody like me um, who knows what to look for. Uh, and I want to go back. We might, might be getting to this later on, but I want to go back to the medical system for just a second mm -hmm. because I notice in, in menopause groups, there's a lot of doctor bashing that goes on. It's yeah. like, why don't they know what's going on? Right. Well, the medical system is not aligned. The incentives in the medical system aren't aligned to incentivize any doctors to go get educated on hormones. And it's not something that they learned in medical school. Um, there was actually a study done a year or so ago by AARP where they surveyed OBGYN residency programs. Okay, so OBGYNs, we think they are the hormone experts, right? 20% right. of those programs had any education in hormones at all. And of the 20% that did, most of it was elective. And so we, we wonder why nobody knows anything because they're not taught it. Um, and yeah. so what, what you end up with is, a, is doctors who see that there is money to be made, um, on hormone specialty, they go out, they do a fellowship, and then they set up shop as a concierge practice. And it still leaves most women kind of on the outskirts of getting good quality care. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that's, that's alarming 20%. I mean, you, you, women are trained to think OBG, like, well, who's your OBG? And they think they're going to someone that's going to, you know, authentically and really love them and help them and, and where they're at in this process of life. And, um, the antidepressants, you know, the birth control, um, Dr. Jolene Brighton, thank her soul for coming out with the book that she did and being able to help young women. And I really love where you said that this book is for what to expect when expecting for women in their late thirties, because, you know, approaching 40 very soon, I myself have had a myriad of hormone issues that maybe are very disconnected, but more so brought on by stress and, and different myriads. And so what woman isn't really bombarded by stress and this whole mind body piece that's exploded right now, we're starting to finally understand the importance of stress and how it breaks down our hormones. So the, the whole system is kind of set up for a lot of hope, but women leave even more frustrated, even more fearful, and even more lonely in which they end up, like you've said, on these online programs and in these different Facebook groups. And there's just a lot of people that speculate and have different experiences that isn't really helpful for somebody that's individually yeah. going through things and has maybe a toxicity issue, maybe it's a hormonal issue, maybe it's a genetic issue, and it really needs to be taken seriously. And so I really appreciate that you lay the groundwork in this book for women that are not like, oh my gosh, I'm here now, what do I do? But how do we really trace this back and get to younger women and say, taking care of your hormones is incredibly important on your now years and what you're going to experience in the next 10. So great job on that. So yeah, is there anything else that you want to share on, on that piece? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I just, um, it, it, when I see doctor bashing, I just kind of I just kind of go, because I, I know that it's not their fault. I've worked in a doctor's office and I know what the, yeah. what kind of pressure they're under to, I mean, they're, you know, they're production workers, they, yeah. they're, they're a factory model. And um, I, it, it's unfortunate um, that everybody doesn't get that kind of training and can't offer women the help that they need. Mm-hmm. So, and we know, you know, functional medicine has really taken a hold on this, um, individuals as yourself. So when you are working with a woman, uh, you know, what, what is your, what does your practice look like right now? And let's say a woman comes to you and whatever stage they're at in, in perimenopause or menopause, you know, how do you kind of start that process up for them changing over from that model? What does a model look like for you and how we can start to measure these different baselines to help them along in their journey? Well, I generally use um, Dutch testing in my practice, which is a dried urine test. 
Right. And it, um, so I really have a, a three-step process. So the first, the first thing I do is look at lifestyle and what are people eating and how are they sleeping and how are they moving and what have they tried that's worked and what have they tried that hasn't worked. And so we, we get all of that background first. Um, and the first part of my written plan for anybody is always about their lifestyle. So mm -hmm. what do we need to change? And a lot of times just getting rid of sugar and alcohol mm -hmm. fixes everything. Yeah. Um, a little bit of stress management and, and, you know, we're good to go. And, you know, I love what you said about stress because my belief is that stress is the underlying cause of almost all hormone imbalances. Cause you look at, countries that are less developed than the United States and another, you know, really developed countries and they don't have this. Right. Um, women just go through menopause. It's not a big deal. And, and everybody's not just suffering. And to me, the stress is the, is the, the linchpin of what's going on. So with lifestyle, let's stop there for a moment because lifestyle is, you know, I think we'd probably both agree maybe 75% of the whole picture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of women I feel suffer from a lot of the same things with lifestyle and that would be stress. But you mentioned that, you know, sugars and alcohol and some of these things, obviously, you know, they mess up our adrenals and deal with different insulin issues. Um, what are some of the biggest things that you believe that women can do based on their lifestyle that can make big changes right away? So number one, sleep. Now people will watch this and go, but Dr. Anna, if I could sleep, I would. Mm -hmm. And there's some truth to that. Um, but at least allowing a container for sleep. Um, so allowing yourself eight or nine hours to go to bed, even if it's broken sleep, um, we can do things to work on the actual staying asleep part. But, you know, if you're going to bed at midnight and getting up at 5 AM, you know, you just can't. Right. Um, and our bodies are, are, are allowed to heal when we sleep and to rebalance and reset. And so if, if you are, burning the candle at, at both ends, it, there's just not a workable way to get everything back in balance. There really isn't. And I think people don't understand that and they can just like gun their way through it, but eventually their body goes, yeah, not so much. And then that's when the adrenal issues start. Um, uh, you know, a real game changer for a lot of people is to give up alcohol because if you have night sweats and hot flashes, I can guarantee you if you stop drinking alcohol, that's probably going to get better. Um, because and what is the link with alcohol and night sweats and, and those that you find it is so impactful in stopping drinking? Because the so, glass of wine at night really does do the trick for a lot of women in their mind. So. Well, it's, it's the go-to strategy for a lot of, of women and, um, you know, myself included. But uh, so alcohol does a lot of things. Number one, it raises your estrogen levels. And so when your estrogen level goes up with that glass of wine and you go to bed, that estrogen level is going to come down sometime during the night. And that's what hot flashes and night sweats are, are related to. It's the big ups and downs in estrogen. Um, the other thing that alcohol does is it raises your blood sugar. And right. so again, blood sugar goes up, blood sugar comes down. And so sometimes uh, night sweats can be related to hypoglycemic episodes. Um, it also affects your cortisol and cortisol is related to night sweats um, and early wakening in the morning. So it's just, you know, there's no real upside to alcohol other than, you know, we think it makes us go to sleep faster, which can be true, but it will basically break your sleep um, in the right. middle of the night. So speaking of cortisol, I have, um, I have a question for you. So you do the Dutch testing, which mm -hmm. is a profound test. I mean, I think they're just, they're really leading the market. And it is. Markers. It's so, it's so fun. Um, I love following Dr. Carrie um, Jones yes. over on there. She's great. She's got yeah. a lot of great information, but um, you know, I've, I do my four cortisol like probably three or four times a year because that's mm -hmm. something I'm really focused on. And so when you're looking at tests and if you could maybe give a percentage of like how many women's cortisol is flipped, um, you know, what would you say as, you know, in your 
kind of bundle of women that you find that that cortisol level is just really rising at night and then tanked in the morning and just takes a while to kind of get back up. Do you see that as a statistical commonality or is that rare? No, it's not rare, but I couldn't really put a number on it. it. That, that nighttime rises, I bet you I see that in 50% of the people. Mm-hmm. I deal with and, and the people that are really low in the morning, like I, I recently re- redid mine and I was like, that's a terrible cortisol pattern. But <laughs> what I also realized was that I wake up really early in the morning and I don't always get up. So I may have missed my cortisol awakening response, which made right. my pattern look completely flat. I was like, I should be dead. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> um, but I rarely see somebody whose cortisol pattern is just nice and circadian and right in the middle of the range. There's usually something going on. And something else that I see really commonly is the mismatch between free cortisol and metabolized cortisol. So insulin resistance can cause one form of that and then hypothyroidism causes it to be the other way. So it really gives me some insight into overall production um, as well as what might be going on behind the scenes that affects that. Right. And that's, that is the, that is probably the number one thing that I like so much about the Dutch test that I was missing with a, you know, a saliva test is you can't see that metabolized cortisol piece. And so we were labeling people with adrenal fatigue that were cranking out cortisol, like it was their job. So yeah. um, it's really allowed me to, to amp up the level of my practice and to um, give my clients better care. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think, you know, on the note of adrenal fatigue, um, I and maybe you can speak into this, I think it's really, it's kind of blown out of proportion of really understanding adrenal fatigue because, you know, we, I always call it like the, the stress pedometer, you know, we're really low and depressed and we can't get out of bed. And then there's like this healthy stress that's right in the middle. And then we're kind of over here and then we just, we're tanked. And by the time we get to adrenal, functional adrenal fatigue, like you're way over that marker and you hit rock bottom. And so women just continue to function at the level that three bar, six bar, 12 foot bar and just one tip or one crack of the wheel can put them down like that. So, you know, you, you probably work with a lot of women with adrenal fatigue. Do you not? Well, I have, I work with a lot of people that have adrenal dysfunction. On their way to adrenal fatigue, let's call it right. adrenal dysfunction. Yeah. I mean, true adrenal burnout is a medical emergency and requires right. things that I don't do. Um, but it's just interesting how many people have really low cortisol and they'll be like, yeah, I go to CrossFit four days a week and I'm just going to keep doing that. So that's what keeps me sane. And I'm like, no, yep. <laughs> you're not. Yep. Yeah, you're on you're on the track to what we just talked about and then collapse and you know, stressors, stressors on the body. Exercise is a stressor on the body. You know, even the ketogenic diet can be a stressor yes. on the body. So it's really helping them understand. And that's why I like you always start with the lifestyle. I mean, all of these different factions really, really matter. The sleep, how hard you exercise, how much you exercise. And we really have to look at them all as stressors on the body and how we can really make sure that we keep those balanced and that we listen to our body. Well, and, and other things that are stressors are things like skipping meals, right? Um, being in air conditioning all the time because your yeah. body needs that up and down and temperature regulation. And people, people don't think about things like that being stressful, right? But, but it all adds up. And that's what I tell people. I said, it's just like layer upon layer upon layer. And then once they're there, they're like, well, can't you just give me a supplement and I'm going to be better? I was like, yeah, in about 12 months, <laughs> you will be because it's not, it's not a fast fix and it really requires some exquisite self care to heal that kind of stuff and get back on track and then set your life up so that you you don't find yourself back in that same position again, because if you heal and you go right back to what you were doing, you're going to be right back in the same place. Yep, absolutely. So we've talked about a little bit about the lifestyle piece, you know, obviously sleep, 
and just trying to balance out the stressors. How about nutrition and supplemental care, whether that's, you know, just looking at his client's overall cycle or, you know, circle of health, as well as perimenopause. What do you find that are some of the more top note supplements? You know, women are really quick to want to go and buy a supplement. Oh, yeah. So we might as well hand it out to them now. <laughs> <laughs> get the <good> so <laughs> open the candy store. Right. Um, so Part of it depends on the age of the woman and how long she's been in perimenopause. So for the younger ones who have just started into perimenopause, I really like Vitex, mm -hmm. balance out estrogen and progesterone. Um, the thing about Vitex, it's an herb and um, it takes several cycles for things to sort of regulate. And so this is not a fast fix kind of thing. Um, it, it takes time, but it can be very effective for, um, helping to balance the estrogen and progesterone because that's, that's what needs to happen. Um, vitamin C is another um, supplement that's been shown to help increase progesterone. So I think there was a small study that said it increased progesterone 7%. Mm. So it's not a huge win, but um, it's, there's certainly not really a downside to vitamin C. I mean, the only you know, negative to it really is if you take too much, you get diarrhea. So you just back right. off the dose. Right. And then um, I like maca for some women. Um, it is a nice adaptogenic uh, um, herbal. It, I mean, it's, it, it'll help with testosterone. It helps with estrogen progesterone balance. Uh, and then for the women who are farther along the path, sometimes we go to progesterone cream. And that has been really effective um, for a lot of my clients as well. I used to just you know, I kind of, my viewpoint on that's kind of shifted over time. Um, it used to be, I would just recommend it to everybody because I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But what I realized is some women really don't respond well to it. So I, I typically now recommend testing before starting that, because if your cortisol is low, you can add progesterone in and it'll drive right into the cortisol pathway and actually make things like anxiety worse, potentially. Um, the other thing women need to understand about progesterone is when, once you start it, if your progesterone is low, your estrogen receptors have downregulated themselves. Um, and so progesterone wakes up those estrogen receptors. Mm -hmm. And so your symptoms actually can get worse for a little while before they get better. And so that really uh, upsets a lot of women. But if you can kind of push through that, things generally straighten out pretty quickly. Yeah. So you have a background in pharmacy mm -hmm. and there's a lot of questions for women around bioidentical hormones. Now I will say for myself, um, you know, with just really a lot of different menses problems my whole life due to stress and other things, um, you know, for me, it's, it's really, less just about hormonal balance, but it's looking back out another 10 to 15 years of my life, yeah. looking at um, getting ahead of osteoporosis, um, you know, just a whole host of things that, you know, really, really matter. But when it comes to bioidentical hormones, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of confusion. Um, and so could you maybe just tap in on to this? Now, I don't know, are you able to prescribe bioidenticals at all or? No. Okay. Um, because pharmacists in North Carolina can't prescribe. Okay. Now, what I will say is there are uh, bioidentical forms of every hormone other than testosterone available on the internet, but that does not mean that you should go out and get them. Right. <laughs> Very so, dangerous. The, the point really is, is that I have a lot of things I can work with um, that don't necessarily need a prescription. And right. honestly, the, the clients that, want to see me generally are trying to avoid prescriptions. So mm -hmm. I tend to attract women who, it's so funny being a pharmacist. It's like, I get all the people who, who don't, I don't want, want drugs. Just tell me how to address my <laughs> lifestyle. I don't want that stuff. Well, it's I went to school for six years for this. So um, anyway, well, I think they hear the words like breast cancer and could increase yeah. cancer and cancer and cancer and cancer. And they're just like, don't want to go there. Tell me what I can do be before I get to that step. But some people need it. So yeah, absolutely. And it can be a, a real game changer for people. So let's, let's talk about cancer, cancer, cancer. Right. Um, so the study that got everybody all panicked about hormones came out in 2002. It was called the women's health initiative study. 
And I want to talk about this because it's really important um, for people to understand what that study included and what it showed. So they took women who on average were in their early 60s and the ones who had had hysterectomies got estrogen alone, oral estrogen alone, um, Premarin specifically, which is made from pregnant mare's urine. Okay, mm -hmm. so that was one group. The second group who had not had hysterectomies got Premarin plus Provera, which is a synthetic progestin, not progesterone, um, in combination. And the purpose of the study was to look at the effects on bone health and heart health and I can't remember what all they were actually trying to study. But it was stopped early because the women in the combination group were having higher incidences of blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes, hmm. and a higher incidence of breast cancer. Okay, so everybody just lost their minds. Right. And women all over the country were pulled off of estrogen immediately, and estrogen was marked with the big red X and it's like, no, it's dangerous. It causes all these things. Well, that study has been reanalyzed about, I don't even know how many different times in various pieces, but ultimately what was found was that the synthetic progestin was the bad actor in the study. And, and that's what increased the risk of breast cancer. Hmm. So, so with, with progestin, um, you know, progesterone, progestin. Can you define the differentiation? I mean, there's precursors, there's all these different things. Can you define pro what progestin is from progesterone for our listeners? So the medical community has this bucket called progestins and everything but progesterone, and it's lumped in this bucket, everything but progesterone in that bucket is synthetic. So it's man-made. It is not similar to a compound that your body makes. Okay. Progesterone is the same chemical structure that your body makes when you ovulate. There okay, is so it's a synthetic form. It is not bioidentical not with the body. Identical. Okay. But, but progesterone is. Yep. Okay. Good. So back to the study. So the, the estrogen alone group actually had a small protective effect against breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Provera synthetic progestins, bad. Um, and that actually was uh, borne out in a fairly recent study of low-dose birth control pills and, um, and hormone-impregnated IUDs, where they also showed a slight increase in breast cancer risk in people who use those products. So um, that kind of was confirmatory about that result. Let me think about where I was going with this. But, okay, let's talk about heart attacks, blood clots, and strokes. Mm -hmm. That actually was real, and that's because it was an oral form of estrogen. And when oral estrogen passes through your liver to be yep. um, metabolized, it increases uh, the amount of clotting factors that you have. And all three of those things are caused by clotting issues. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, I rarely, if ever, recommend being on an oral estrogen. Um, there are patches, there are gels, there are creams, there are so many other dosage forms that why take the risk and unless somebody just can't afford, you know, those other dosing forms, um, I, I'm just kind of like, you know, why, why yeah. take the risk? And I see that, um, common where, you know, the estrogen, all the different families of estrogen will be put on as a topical mm -hmm. and bypass that liver pathway. Yes. And progesterone has been now more so. Now, we understand that there's yam creams and all these different progesterone creams like you were talking about. You would just, yeah, everybody go get a progesterone cream. I mean, women even use it on their face for anti-aging. But do you see that progesterone actual internal intake is actually more impactful? So it's kind of the flip where estrogen is transdermal progesterone internal, do you see more of an effect with progesterone being internally taken versus these topicals? It really depends on what you need it for. So I personally take oral progesterone because insomnia has been my personal piece of menopause hell. So do I. Um, it's helped immensely. Oh, <laughs> I, I, didn't get enough, I didn't get enough reprieve from the creams. I just didn't. And Well, and, and you wouldn't because they work completely differently. 
Exactly. So the, the oral progesterone, when it goes into your liver, it's not hard on your liver. Don't make that mistake. Right. It's metabolized in your liver, right? as are many drugs. Um, and it makes a compound called allopregnenolone, mm -hmm. which is what makes you sleepy. It crosses mm -hmm. your blood-brain barrier. It makes you sleepy. If you use cream and you bypass your liver, you don't get that same benefit. Right. Um, but it, it can be very, the creams can be very helpful for heavy periods or anxiety or things like that. So it really just depends on what the situation is. Yeah. So that's just another example of a nuance, why it's really important to, yeah. to be in touch with someone like you because, you know, I've been taking progesterone, but it hasn't worked or using progesterone for infertility. There's all these different avenues mm -hmm. of why we use them and how to use them and what's best for you to right. not get cogged up in the, in the body or stored or just peed out really. So yeah, I remember my first time I took progesterone pills internally and I was like, I called my friend Anne. I'm like, I'm on my way to bed. I've never been so exhausted in my life. I'm finally, I've, I had not felt tired for probably 18 years, <laughs> you know? So, well, I, I tell my doctor, I'm like, y'all gonna have to pry this out of my cold dead hand. Cause yeah. I never given this up. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. Um, I think other supplements that come to mind that are really helpful for women, which I know are probably a part of your list would probably be magnesium. I mean, I'm oh, sure definitely a huge outcome with magnesium and women, how we're deficient with that. So definitely. And adaptogenic herbs. I love adaptogenic herbs to help with cortisol, whether it's high or low. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I have any clients that I haven't rec recommended an adaptogen to. So um, what are your thoughts on DIM and, um, you know, calcium uh, glucurate. glucurate and some of those, because I feel like those can kind of be some of those products too, that women just go and grab and maybe sometimes aren't yeah. appropriate. So you need to know that you need DIM. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and this is where the Dutch test really shines as well, because we get to see those metabolic path pathways. So we can see if it's sluggish and needs some support and we need to make sure that your metabol metabolites are going down the safest pathway to help you not get breast cancer. That's great. And we can manipulate that pathway with DIM. But if your estrogen is already low and you start taking DIM, you are not going to be happy about that mm -hmm. because it's going to further lower your estrogen and potentially worsen your symptoms. Um, calcium deglucurate is really helpful for that phase two metabolism of the estrogen where it's eliminated from your body. So there are some women who you know, don't methylate well or have other issues going on. And so a DIM product that includes calcium deglucurate is great because you've killed two birds with one stone. So again, this is where you need to, you need to understand what you're doing. Yep. And I think that's true for everything, but this is particularly something that you need to understand what you're doing. Yep. Now, one piece I wanted to um, explore with you, because I think it's very important because of our lifestyle as women and as men too, is this estrogen um, dominance syndrome for, I mean, I think I heard a statistic, 70% of women will be estrogen dominant at some time in their life. Yep. And most women will never know that they're estrogen dominant. Now, I personally am a very estrogen dominant person. Person, but lack estrogen. And so this is that thing where, okay, well, should you take DIM? Well, if you, you're not methylating correctly, like it doesn't really necessarily mean you're actually producing estrogen. It means that you have toxicity in the body or you're not able to get rid of the estrogen. Right. So you really have to then look at, it's not a hormonal issue per se, but a detoxification issue. Exactly. So maybe you could explore a little bit about the impact that you've seen with estrogen dominance in your practice with women. It is 90% of the practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that is what results in weight gain and breast tenderness and, uh, you know, bloating and all the things that just women find so irritating and annoying. And you're right. It is, it can be either a production issue or a lack of elimination issue. So there are some things that are really important to consider mm -hmm. first, those metabolic pathways. And, and the second thing is constipation. Because if you are constipated, you are recirculating your estrogen over and over. And I think women don't, that probably never even comes to mind that, oh, estrogen is eliminated in poop. Who knows that? Right. Um, 
And then yeah, I and everything think, else and all the other toxins, you're exactly. retoxing, not only toxicity, but your estrogens. That's really interesting. I've never thought of that. Good point. Right. Um, and then also to take a look at what, what are you putting on your face? So like I'm in the school of applied functional medicine right now. And the woman that runs that school is like, your skin is like a giant mouth. Don't put anything on it that you wouldn't put in your mouth. And I'm like, that's true. Um, and so cosmetics are just full, you know, cosmetics, sunscreens are just full of chemicals yeah. that are endocrine disruptors that basically go into your body and sit in your estrogen receptors and allow that free estrogen to just keep circulating around and not do its job and to cause estrogen dominance that way. And then in women who are overweight, fat tissue actually makes its own estrogen. And so it's just, it's like this vicious cycle where it's just overload, overload, overload. And so, um, you know, some of the things that I work with my clients on are gut health, you know, for mm -hmm. constipation. I have them increase their fiber a lot because fiber keeps things moving along and pulls estrogen out. So, you know, it's a whole lifestyle shift, um, getting rid of the processed foods and sugar and all the things. And the other thing about estrogen dominance is that it can, it can really make you, uh, it can make you think you have thyroid symptoms when you really don't, well, you do have the symptoms, but you don't have thyroid disease because uh, it blocks the thyroid receptors. And so women will come up with completely clinically normal lab tests on their thyroid. So even the whole panel can look normal, but they have symptoms because their estrogen is so high. So oh, that's it's a mess. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, yeah, thyroid is a whole nother time. <laughs> that's a whole different podcast. <laughs> well, and going back to the estrogen dominance, you know, I am in the beauty industry. I've been a part of it and I make all my own skincare and hair care mm -hmm. and CBD. And, you know, that was one pivotal thing. When I started formulating products, it was actually to help women with hormonal issues. That was kind of like my passion because when I started doing functional medicine training years ago, I remember sitting, I tell this story, I remember sitting with Robert Rakowski. Do you know who he is? Mm -hmm. So he was down and we were all in this classroom and he started mixing all these things and putting it in a blender. Um, you know, and he was kind of sharing what kind of concoctions that we have in, in the industry. And I'm like, no way, no how. And I saw the hormonal issue and the toxicity issue for women. And that when I created an organic salon, it would be out of necessity, not out of marketing, because God knows I thought the market would be far along from now right. where it's at. But um, Julie Tappan, a friend of mine, a functional medicine practitioner, she had a 20 year old girl in college and she was so insanely estrogen dominant and she was a healthy, very healthy young woman um, set aside that she was on the dance team. She was 20 something, always putting hair products, skin products, tanning lotions, all of these things on her body. And they did an experiment and she said, I need you to let go of these things. I know it's hard because it's your vanity, um, but you need to stop. And she did. And three months later, they tested and her estrogen had cleaned up entirely. So to your point, it is critical that women take inventory, plastics, makeup, hair care, all of those things that just sit and ruminate around the ecosystem really do make an incredible difference. Well, and, and if you think about it, you know, now we're seeing, you know, girls as young as like six and seven right. start pu puberty. I mean, where's that coming from? It's coming from all of the stuff they're exposed to. Yep. Absolutely. You can't turn away from that actually being a testimony to this is really critical. So. Well, and they have finally this year, I mean, why did it take so long? Come out and said, oh, chemical sunscreen's not so great. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Make that carcinogen into your body, would you? Right, exactly. Yeah. And we've been lathering our children with sunscreen since birth. Yep. Tiny little ages soaking that in. It's, it's, it's harsh. And, you know, to that note, you know, people like you, you have an incredible knack for marketing. You're an incredible writer. You have great blogs, great information out there. And this is becoming, you know, we would think in a time easier to understand and find this information where, you know, I learned from another practitioner that Google changed their algorithms and people like Mercola, which we've all heard of Dr. Mercola, you know, alternative medicine websites have gone down 80% 
you know, of being able to find these kind of, this kind of, and that's just so awful. So we really do have to be our own advocate. Now, um, you know, within the hormones, we've talked about lifestyle, we've talked about estrogen dominance, a little bit about you know, how we should be cautious in working with a professional when it comes to progesterone and estrogen. You know, these are kind of these topical things that I hear a lot of women frustrated with when they sit in the chair. Are there any other pieces a part of this puzzle when women are either in their 38 through 940, start going through menopause um, that they should be aware of, or that's been helpful that you found with women and how you bring them through your, your program? Let's talk about weight loss. <laughs> I'm getting ready to start my weight loss program again. I saw that. So <laughs> by the time this is recorded and let out, you are starting um, a weight loss program. And I had written down, it's called New Scrap the Scale Program for Midlife Scrap Women scale. Facing When It Comes to Weight Hormones and Mindset Cover These Top Four Mistakes. So maybe we could just go over the top four mistakes. So the top four mistakes... I'm going to have to remember them right off my head. That's always fun. Let's uh, <laughs> go ahead. Let's just do two of them. Okay. So the top four mistakes are not eating enough mm-hmm. because when women gain weight, their natural tendency is to slash calories. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I have somebody saying, I'm only eating a thousand calories a day. I'm like, there's your problem. Um, because that, uh, send your body into starvation mode, which causes more cortisol to be produced. And then that's when the weight gain around the middle starts. And it, again, this is a vicious cycle. So in Scrap the Scale, what we do is we get women eating a lot more food. Yep. And, you know, it's not like a gazillion calories or anything. We don't count calories. So, um, but it's, it's healthy. It's nutritious. We take out grains and dairy um, for the first uh, three weeks Mm -hmm. to see, to to give women a chance to just be observers of their body. It's kind of like the the lab that is your body Um, and and get them to start thinking about what foods feel like love to them. So, you know, I know that I don't do well with gluten. It doesn't keep me from eating it occasionally, but I know that does not feel like love to me. Pizza does not feel like love. Right. Um, so that's, that's a major component of the program is getting people to think about movement and food in, in, a, in the way of what feels like love. But, um, so that's one of the big mistakes is the not eating enough. The second is over-exercising. Yeah. So, you know, people say, I'm working out twice a day and doing CrossFit every day. I'm not losing any weight. Yes, because your cortisol is too high. So, you know, we've talked about cortisol several times do, during this, and it kind of is just this running theme of what, the effects of cortisol really are. And it goes back to my, my underlying belief that stress and cortisol is the root of the whole problem. So, yeah, yeah, I really, I'm fully agree with you. And one thing I think too, um, is mindset. You could use mindset, you could use meditation. Um, I do a lot of hypnotherapy for clients Mm -hmm. and heart math came out with some really, really incredible, uh, and they have just an incredible bank of, of data it regardless, but that our heart has over 40,000 neurons in it. And it has more power to send information up to our brain than our brain does to it. And so when we're in this coherence, the study has shown that when we're in this coherence, meaning when we get into this, a, a, a meditation could be a walk and you're just in in a bliss, in mm-hmm. a meditation. It, it sometimes could even be a run, but you get into coherence where there's this perfect um, equal value through these different frequencies that the heart actually gets in so in sync, it actually produces and lets off healthy hormone production. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's the exercise, the food component, but when we really, really get down to brass tacks, that it's completely free, accessible to everybody is really learning how to manage our brain and manage our stress components and understand what stressors really are because we have all these perceptions of what we think are stress, but what are they really? Um, so I think that's another component. And I'm sure you would agree with just seeing the women so stressed out coming into your practice and working with meditation. Absolutely. Um, and you know, 
in, in Scrap the Scale, we really get into what are you using food for? Yeah. Is it fuel or is it to numb you? And what what is behind the numbing? Is it because you don't have pleasure in yeah. areas of your life? Have you just forgotten how to be mindful with your food? I mean, I have a client right now, I swear to God, I said to her last weekend, I want you to sit down at a table without anything that has an on and off switch mm-hmm. and eat your food. Right. She did it one time. It was so uncomfortable that she just couldn't do it. She was like, eh, I ate on the couch the rest of the time. I'm like, come on. Yeah. And she's a psychologist. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we've, we've gotten in this pattern of constantly numbing out ourselves and not yes. being present with ourselves and not being present and emotional with our emotions and vulnerable with ourselves, let alone mm-hmm. we're able to be vulnerable with other people. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, you enter a program like yours and we invest in these things, but we only go at it 20, 30%. It's just like me buying every marketing online program, right. but I never finish a damn That's one of them. Thing. Right. You know, you're my marketing guru too. So I think that's, I just think it's really important. I think, you know, the lifestyle and the mindset is probably the first and foremost. And I'm just saying that to say that to myself. I'm sure you remind yourself of that. But for women to think all these supplements and all these programs and even understanding your hormones, it doesn't matter at the end of the day if you can't control your own stressors and your own mind. It just doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you have come out with your book. So are you doing any fun like book tour? And I saw online today that you have this Medipreneur um, like program and you invite other pharmacists in and you help them with that. Or do you still do that? Uh, I did that for two years, this this past April and the year before. So I I helped get it started. Um, But speaking of stressors, (laughs) something on my plate had to go and that was it. Okay. So Metapreneurs does still exist. My two people that I started it with are, you know, to have taken it and are um, running with it to Cincinnati next year, which is great. Right. Um, it just did not feel like an absolute yes to me anymore. Yep. Um, and I had other things I wanted to do. So I'm in the process of figuring out, you know, where I want to go to do book signings. I'm, I'm lining up one in Atlanta. I've done one here in Asheville already. Um, I basically kind of took the summer off to play. Yeah, as you look, it's not been number one on the radar screen. I'm getting ready to go to Africa next week, so um, that's, that's my right. you're going on vacation. Yeah, I love that. My sixth well, birthday have, present to myself. It's your sixtieth birthday. Well, happy birthday! Oh, that'll be a ton of fun. It's so good to get out of our ecosystem and open yes. up our brains and and get out of ourselves. <laughs> Um, well, I, I want to congratulate you with the book and I actually am going to purchase it tonight and I'm really excited. And at the salon, which you can see behind me, we mm-hmm. have a host of really incredible women and, uh, that book is going to lay in our, in our, oh, great. Uh, Thank you. so women can open that up and read it. Is awesome. there anything else that you would want our Awaken Beauty listeners to know about you and where can we find you? Um, You can find me at www.dranagarrett.com. You can also find me on Facebook on my Dr. Anna Garrett page. And I I do have a private uh, Facebook group for women who are in any stage of midlife transition called the Hormone Harmony Club. Okay. Um, You can find me on YouTube. Uh, I'm ramping up that channel as we speak and um, it's going to be called it's just my name right now, but it's going to be Hormone Harmony with Dr. Anna Garrett. You can find me on Instagram, but I don't do a whole lot over there. So it's not the best place. To look That's for me. okay. Know your platform. Yeah. And just so everybody knows, it's Dr. Anna, A-N-N-A-G-A-R-R-E-T-T. So it's two R's and two T's. And she just has a wealth of great blog articles and a lot of just breaking it down into layman terms that women can understand and start this journey. And it's never too soon and it's never too late, right? Well, and I have like a two minute quiz on there that people can take just to see, you know, how they score on perimenopause symptoms if they're curious to know, hey, is this maybe perimenopause or not? So that's great. That's on, that's on my website. And to end the podcast for the Awaken Beauty listeners, I always ask a personal question is, what is something that you have personally awakened to in your life as of recently? That is an interesting question because this summer, while I was busy not striving, 
I realized that striving um, really doesn't get you any further than just sort of, uh, I don't even know what the word is. Letting things just come just in unfold. and go. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it is such a much more lovely place to operate from. Mm -hmm. From your lips to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Dr. Anna, I cannot thank you enough for being on the Awaken Beauty podcast. And for all of you listeners, make sure that you go over to the Awaken Beauty podcast and subscribe to wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We also are on YouTube. And thank you for being a part of our time today with Dr. Anna Garrett. And until next time, stay sane, get sleep, and bring your sexy back. And thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello, Awaken Beauty. Thank you so much for joining the show today. Were you inspired? Please leave a comment or your own personal aha moment so others can capture exactly what you did. Also, please like and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And if you're interested in high quality natural products for your hair, skin, and wellness, including organic, CBD, please visit evokebeauty.com. Again, that is evokebeauty.com, E-V-O-Q beauty.com. And until next time, darling, stay sane, get sleep, and bring your sexy back. <laughs> <laughs>